All right, we're almost done with the book. We're getting to the end. We are on chapter 19, Advanced Features. Let that sink in, Advanced Features. All right, let's get it. Advanced Features. By now, you've learned the most commonly used parts of the Rust programming language. Before we do one more project in chapter 20, we'll look at a few aspects of the language you might run into every once in a while. You can use this chapter as a reference for when you encounter any unknowns when using Rust. The features you'll learn to use in this chapter are useful in very specific situations. Although you might not reach for them often, we want to make sure you have a grasp of all the features Rust has to offer. In this chapter, we'll cover unsafe Rust, how to opt out of some of Rust guarantees and take responsibility for manually upholding those guarantees, advanced traits, associated traits, default type parameters, fully qualified syntax, super traits, and the new type pattern in relation to traits. Advanced types, more about the new type pattern type aliases, the never type, and dynamically sized types, advanced functions and closures, function pointers and returning closures, macros, ways to define code that defines more code at compile time. It's a panoply of Rust features with something for everyone. Let's dive in. Okay. Okay. Um, unsafe. I'm curious to learn about it. Probably will never use it. Never say never. The associative, or associated traits and associated types and all this stuff here, I don't know about. Default type parameters just sound useful to know in general. Um, advanced types, no idea about. Advanced functions and closures, sure. Macros is something I see used everywhere. So that's just definitely something we need to learn. Anyway, moving onward. Unsafe Rust. All the code we've discussed so far has had Rust memory safety guarantees enforced at compile time. However, Rust has a second language hidden inside it that doesn't enforce these memory safety guarantees. It's called Unsafe Rust and works just like regular Rust, but gives us extra superpowers. Unsafe Rust exists because, by nature, static analysis is conservative. When the compiler tries to determine whether or not code upholds the guarantees, it's better for it to reject some valid programs rather than accept some invalid programs. Although the code might be okay, as far as Rust is able to tell, it's not. In these cases, you can use unsafe code to tell the compiler, trust me, I know what I'm doing. The downside is that you use it at your own risk. If you use unsafe code incorrectly, problems due to memory unsafety, such as null pointers, dereferencing, can occur. Another reason Rust has an unsafe alter ego is that the underlying computer hardware is inherently unsafe. If Rust didn't let you do unsafe operations, you couldn't do certain tasks. Rust needs to allow you to do low-level system programming, such as directly interacting with the operating system or even writing your own operating system. Working with low-level system programming is one of the goals of the language. Let's explore what we can do with unsafe Rust and how to do it. So in this big blob of text, they covered two to three things. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. So they said, um, one, the reason why unsafe exists is because static analysis by nature is conservative, as in there are scenarios where the compiler can't tell whether or not the code you wrote is correct, and because of that, it's going to say it's invalid because that is a, a, just a better answer overall. It adheres to the you can trust the compiler mentality. So the, if the compiler tells you it's correct and you can run it, then by all means, you can always run it. If it tells you that it's incorrect, then there's still the slight possibility that you are correct, but the compiler just doesn't know. And to uh, deal with those cases, you have to have something. So and that's un that's the unsafe Rust part. But also another reason, which I didn't really think about, is that 
the underlying hardware operating systems all that other stuff is unsafe by nature and since rust is a systems programming language it has to allow you to manipulate those things and the only way it can allow you to manipulate those things if you have something that allows you to do things that are unsafe hence unsafe rust so yeah, kind of cool moving on unsafe superpowers to switch to unsafe rust use the unsafe keyword and then start a new block that holds the unsafe code you could take four actions in unsafe rust called unsafe superpowers that you can't in safe rust these superpowers include the ability to dereference a raw pointer call an unsafe function or method access or modify a mutable static variable Ooh. implement an unsafe trait access fields of unions uh okay unsafe superpowers these they say four one two three four five they said there was only four actions but this is a list of five things maybe one of these is convoluted like two and one i don't know It's important to understand that unsafe doesn't turn off the borrow checker or disable any of the Rust safety checks. If you use a reference in unsafe code, it will still be checked. The unsafe keyword only gives you access to those four features that are then not checked by the compiler for memory safety. You'll still get some degree of safety inside of the unsafe block. All right, so what they're saying here is that even though it's an unsafe block and the keyword is unsafe, there's still some checks that are going on. You're just not going to get the memory safety checks within that block. But there's still some safety checks to, you know, hold your hand. In addition, unsafe does not mean the code inside the block is necessarily dangerous or that it will definitely have memory safety problems. The intent is that as the programmer, you'll ensure that the code inside an unsafe block will access memory in a valid way. Okay? Uh, so this is more like a warning to people that see the unsafe keyword than anything else. Just because somebody uses the unsafe keyword does not mean the code inside the block is unsafe. It is up to the programmers, the programmers intent to make sure the code inside the unsafe block is safe to access memory in all valid ways. So, so don't make that assumption. The two aren't necessarily correlated. People are fallible. And mistakes will happen, but by requiring those four unsafe operations to be inside blocks annotated with unsafe, you'll know that any errors related to memory safety must be within an unsafe block. Keep unsafe blocks small. You'll be thankful later when you investigate memory bugs. Okay, um, I'm not exactly sure how it does it, but the four, uh, there were five bullet points, but the four features seemingly allow all of the memory issues that could happen when you do things that are quote unquote unsafe or things within unsafe block. Uh, all the issues will happen within that block as well. So you should try to keep those blocks small so when you're investigating issues later, you don't have to dig as hard. To isolate unsafe code as much as possible, it's best to enclose unsafe code within a safe abstraction and provide a safe API, which we'll discuss later in the chapter when we examine unsafe functions and methods. Parts of the standard library are implemented as safe abstractions over unsafe code that has been audited. Wrapping unsafe code in a safe abstraction prevents uses of unsafe from leaking out into all the places that you or your users might want to use the functionality implemented with unsafe code because using a safe abstraction is safe. All right, so they're not going to explain it completely yet or right now, but there are ways to write unsafe code and then to wrap the unsafe code in a safe abstraction. And the safe abstraction, by the, the, the wording, is safe for everybody to use and it probably adheres to all the memory stuff as well. So yeah, there's ways to write unsafe code and make sure it is completely safe by wrapping it in a safe abstraction. I don't know when they're going to get to that, though. It's probably late in this document. The book only has so many pages left. <laughs> Let's look at each of the four unsafe superpowers in turn. 
We'll also look at some abstractions that provide a safe interface to unsafe code. All right. Dereferencing a raw pointer. In chapter four, in the dangling references section, we mentioned that the compiler ensures references are always valid. Unsafe Rust has two new types called raw pointers that are similar to references. As with references, raw pointers can be immutable or mutable and are written as star constant t and star mutable t, respectively. The asterisk isn't the dereference operator. It's part of the type name. In the context of raw pointers, immutable means that the pointer cannot be directly assigned to after being dereferenced. Huh, that is that is slightly different. Okay, so going over some of the stuff they said here. Uh, unsafe Rust has two new types called raw pointers. And they can be mutable or immutable. And they have the star asterisk, but the star does not mean dereference in this sense. It's just part of the name, like a name of the type. And they say that immutable means that the pointer cannot be directly assigned to after being dereferenced. So, okay, immutable definition is slightly different, but it's more or less the same what we think of. Once you assign it something to that name, you can't assign anything else to that name. Moving on. Different from references and smart pointers, raw pointers are allowed to ignore the borrowing rules by having both immutable and mutable pointers or multiple mutable pointers to the same location huh. aren't guaranteed to point to valid memory makes sense are allowed to be null don't implement any automatic cleanup oh all right so this list is kind of terrifying like the first one is meh because a lot of languages do things like that Rust doesn't, but that's common. Aren't guaranteed to point to valid memory. Makes sense because we're in the unsafe and doing unsafe things, quote unquote, possibly with memory. Allowed to be null. Uh, okay, maybe they're going to introduce a null variable. Let's see. And the one I'm most scared about is they don't have any automatic cleanup. That means you have to handle the cleaning up of your, your, your memory. Mm. Opting out of having Rust enforce these guarantees, you can give up guaranteed safety in exchange for greater performance or the ability to interface with another language or hardware where Rust guarantees don't apply. Listing 19-1 shows how to create an immutable and a mutable raw pointer from references. Okay. Uh, let mutable number equal five and then R1 is a reference as and this is the type I32 and then here's a mutable reference and they're casting it to the raw point is raw pointer one which is a immutable and raw pointer two which is mutable and I'm guessing this has to be within an unsafe block but maybe not. What do they say here? Note that we don't include the unsafe keyword in this code. We can create raw pointers in safe code. We just can't dereference raw pointers outside an unsafe block, as you'll see in a bit. I see. So if what they're saying is true, then I can just put this in my editor and there'll be no errors. So let's check that out. Terminal and let's format this. How do I run? Yeah, there were no errors. There were warnings because I'm not using them, but they're right. I can do that in safe Rust code. We've created raw pointers by using as to cast an immutable and a mutable reference into their corresponding raw pointer types. 
Because we created them directly from references guaranteed to be valid, we know these particular raw pointers are valid, but we can't make that assumption about just any raw pointer. Next, we'll create a raw pointer whose validity we can't be so certain of. Listing 19-2 shows how to create a raw pointer to an arbitrary location in memory. Trying to use arbitrary memory is undefined. There might be data at that address or there might not. The compiler might optimize the code so there is no memory access or the program might error with a segmentation fault. Usually there is no good reason to write code like this, but it is possible. And then here they wrote the address and then they tried to map the address to an I32. Ooh, like this is the address like on machine hardware memory, like the memory address. Um, I'm not gonna write that, yeah. Recall that we can create raw pointers in safe code, but we can't dereference raw pointers and read the data being pointed to. In listing 19-3, we use the dereference operator star on a raw pointer that requires an unsafe block. Okay, so let's go with this one. This one looks much safer. All right, so that ran. Um, let's look at it real quick. We have let mutable number five, and then we have a constant reference to it, raw pointer, and then we have a mutable reference to it, raw pointer, and then we just printed the, both of the raw pointers out. And what they're stating here is that in order to be able to read from that memory, we would have to do that in an unsafe block because the reading will require dereferencing, which is noted by the star. Okay. Creating a pointer does no harm. It's only when we try to access the value that it points at that we might end up dealing with an invalid value. Note also that in listing 19-1 and 19-3, we created a star constant i32 and star mutable i32 raw pointers that both point to the same memory location where num is stored. If we instead try to create an immutable and immutable reference to num, the code would not have compiled because Rust ownership rules don't allow a mutable reference at the same time as any immutable references. With raw pointers, we can create a mutable pointer and an immutable pointer to the same location and change data through the mutable pointer, potentially creating a data race. So uh, be careful. All right, so here they're noting what we actually did here, which is we created a mutable reference, but then right here we created both an immutable reference and a mutable reference pointing to the same location in memory, which in terms of borrowing rules is not allowed. You're not allowed to have a mutable reference that exists in the same space as the immutable ones. And if you have a, if you have a mutable reference, I believe you're only allowed to have one per scope, right? That rule got curved just because we're using raw pointers. So keep that in mind. Oh, they also mentioned data race. Given that you're allowed to do something like this, uh, if you were to use the mutable reference, the mutable reference raw pointer and change the value, that would also change the value of the constant reference to that raw, the constant raw pointer, because they point to the same piece of memory, which would create a data race. With all of these dangers, why would you ever use raw pointers? One major use case is when interfacing with C code. As you'll see in the next section, calling an unsafe function or method. Another case is building up safe abstractions that the borrow checker doesn't understand. We'll introduce unsafe functions and then look at an example of an unsafe abstraction. We'll introduce unsafe function and then look at an example of a safe abstraction that uses unsafe code. 
Okay. So they brought up two examples of why we want to do this. One is the obvious one of interacting with C code because C does all of this stuff naturally, at least from what I hear. I don't, I don't program in C. And then another example is when you want to build up your safe abstraction, you have to build it on top of unsafe code. Because there are times, like they mentioned earlier, where you want to interact with things, let's say like an operating system. That stuff is unsafe by nature. So you have to have some unsafe code, but then you can wrap it in a safe abstraction. 